Good morning. Thank you very much. My name is Jürgen Henschel, being the general manager and director for engineered materials of the Underwriters Laboratories Company here in Europe. Please raise your hand who ever heard about UL as a company before. Some. I ask because that is not a well-known brand in Europe. It's a fairly well-known brand in the United States as well as in Asia. And where does that one come from? I give you a quick overview of our enterprise and what we are aiming and what we are, uh, our mission and our vision is. Um, and uh, that, that gives that picture. Can I have the first slide, please? Ah, there you go. That's good. So we understand ourselves as the global safety science leader. The scientists, engineers are problem solvers helping you to get your problems being addressed and being certified at the end, and that is our major, our major goal in the area of safety, security, and enhanced sustainability. In a more complex world, as we all witness that one, uh, coming up every day, we will need better connectivities, faster digital innovation, all the keywords we all know, stronger network securities, increased compliance and market access, for sure better targets in social and governance scores, greater consumer and employee empowerment, a question which is crucial, it's not the gaining of knowledge anymore, because that's available literally at any point in time, in any moment. It is how do we get the knowledge to the people and do we work with the people? So you, your employees, your partners, your customers, and your suppliers. Safe and healthy environments and improved trans brand transparency are one of the key caveats. I will get a little bit deeper into that area because that is one of our core strengths. Our deployment of UL International is with more than 14,000 employees literally around the globe in more than 40 countries. And as I said, and you see that one easily at that map, we are hosted out of the United States of America, Chicago area, Northbrook, um, where the history of that company stems in electricity and fire, but is now being widened up to all parts of the supply chain worldwide as well as Asia, and you see also a uh, settled environment in the European uh, region. Some data I would like to share with you. We asked, together with some professional companies, our customers and our suppliers, what do they think about the role we, we play? 71% of consumers trust scientists to do the right, thi right thing as opposed to 41% for government leader, leaders and 48% on CEOs. 54% of consumers are willing to pay a premium for brands that are environmentally responsible. 88% of investors manage 25 trillion in assets rank environment as the top priority for investment decisions. And 76% of CEOs foresee the end customer trust as critical to competitiveness over the next five years. So you see these personal, these individual dimension coming up, as well as the shift to the topics why we are here. Our customers tell us that they are facing these key challenges. Slides will be made available after that meeting. Speed and access to market. Well, no, nothing new. Reopening building and w buildings and works, workplaces, a topic which we have present somehow after the last almost two years, uh, but it's something which we don't realize so far. But that's something which is at the heart of our customers. Compliance with regulatory sustainability and procurement requirements. Training personnel on safety requirements. Again, the human factor and the whole story. Risk management, system simplification, and cybersecurity. Global supply chain transparency and data acquisition, the topic why we are here together on stage today now with Circular Rise. And we will get learned to, low, uh, no, learn to know more about that one. Minimizing production and supply chain disruptions, same topic, and we all are hit hard these days by these, by these facts. And last but not least, navigating safety complexities 
and electron of electronic designs, something which is near and dear to our heart every day as we're using more complex products um, down the chain. I don't read you through. That is a quote from one of our bigger customers, HP, and being made from the Chief Sustainability and Social Impact Officer at HP Incorporated, um, valuing the environment and our efforts to go along and our path we, we want to go for. One very practical example from one of our core strengths in our um, certification work and follow-up services. So what we do is we look at products at the beginning of their development together with the providers either of the materials, of the designs, or of the core product as, as such. And then we follow up through the life cycle of that product. If it remains the properties which were promised at the beginning of the development, to the customers, as well as for sure all persons uh, who are in the supply chain and in the development chain. As we face, we have in the, in the ballpark of $13.4 million, the estimated value of counterfeit goods seized. I'll give you a very practical example. We all had that one once in our hand. If you have a distribution cord for power, 220 volts or 110. You all had that one, one, two, three. 10 collected out of the market, five are according to their original specifications, three divert, one is falling out, and one starts to burn. You don't want to have that one in your kid's room for making their PCs or their phones charging. And that is due to alteration on the supply chain of either design, which is fairly easy to discover, but also in exchange of materials. That builds the bridge to what we will learn to know very quick from Circularize now. And that's our aiming point, which we would like to look for. Because that's not easy to identify if you have the product in the market by just looking at it. And the last but not least, an overview of where we think we position ourselves as we move along. We deliver certification, testing, auditing, inspection, verification, learning and development, advisory software and data insights. Huge field, as a matter of fact, we do that one still in a traditional way, by going to manufacturers, by looking at the products, by testing them, ripping them apart, burning them, bending them, and um, looking at the properties as they are promised but we know that there are physical limitations. There are the boundaries of our business model appearing as we're getting more complex and getting more broader supply chains, getting more, uh, getting higher frequency on alteration of products. And that's why we partner up with Circularize in a, in a uh, pilot to make that one to the, to the next level so that we can get us and our value as being a third party certifier into the supply chains of manufacturing of goods. With that said, other than we do it right now, with that said, I give it. Yeah, thank you, Jürgen. Um, hello, everybody. My name is Mesra. I'm one of the founders of Circularize. And um, one thing that Jürgen just mentioned is really, really important. And that is that more and more in supply chains, there is need for transparency transparency around certain characteristics that are intangible. Just looking at this plastic product, I cannot see whether it was recycled, is it made from renewable energy production, like uh, renewable energy usage in, in factories where this was produced, how many times was it shipped across the world, was it uh, used many times over and over again, is this the first life cycle? This is all data that we really, really need for a circular economy to be able to measure it and then also make sure that we make important steps towards it. So Reddit, overall, ESG data and information around sustainability and circular economy is very, very intangible. So the issue that we faced five years ago when we started the company was that if you would go to a certain uh, supplier, that supplier can be audited, they can be certified, you can be sure that they are sustainable in certain characteristics, that their production is up to a certain spec. But that information does not travel through the supply chain. It's very easily lost once it goes to another supplier, to another supplier, to a final product, hopefully recycled, back to another product. 
So the problem, and that is also where we see blockchain and certification as an extremely complementary pair of two technologies or two, two, two domains, is that you can certify something at this point, but that information has trouble going through the supply chain in a very efficient and trustworthy way. In fact, most of it today is done using spreadsheets and emails. How many of you hold spreadsheets around things around LCA and information about mass balancing, etc.? So this is not only extremely labor intensive, especially at scale, but it's also reactive and very prone to error and mistake. And we know supply chains are big and global, so there's always room to make that room for mistake a lot less and make sure that we rely on technologies that can capture that data across the supply chain and transfer it with as little trust as possible. And that's really where blockchains come into place. So in a nutshell, what we do is we create a digital twin of every physical asset. So this is, for example, a bag of Covestro polycarbonate. And it's 25 kg, so the digital twin also equals 25 kg. That's the main unit of measurement. Anything else, such as where it was ma made, what's inside, even the, the, the company's name, um, material composition, things around the LCA, this is all hidden and not accessible by design unless the company wants you to access that data, right? So on the blockchain, you can see that there is an asset with a 25 kg value and it's owned by a certain company, in this case, Covestro. And whenever they sell this bag of 25 kg, the next supplier will be able to own the digital version as well using a QR code on the back. And this is how you can transfer information, capture and attach information, and retrieve it with a very high level of trust because there's a few properties in blockchain that make it exceptionally suitable for transferring information without having to trust every single part of the supply chain. And that is immutability. So once you enter data on a, on a blockchain, you can't just go and say, I, let, let's remove it. You can update it, but you can't remove older histories. And there's self-sovereignty, meaning that you are fully owning it and you don't have to trust me or some, some central company that they are making sure that you're having your own digital twins. There's full self-sovereignty and data immutability. This goes through the supply chain from any step, whether it's a raw material, a part, recycled feedstock, what have you. And any company in that supply chain can be either adding data to it around their production process, et cetera. We've heard from Jurgen, 54% of consumers are willing to pay a premium for sustainability. But more and more consumers, especially younger generations, are extremely digitally savvy and they want to understand not only that you're making a claim that this product is recycled, but they want to understand what, what that claim is based on. They want to see that full history and trust. And for some of you that have seen the NFT market boom now, I personally believe at some point you will not be able to buy products anymore without this digital twin. Everything you buy will have a digital twin that shows the full value chain and supply chain history of that product. That is the level of transparency we require in a supply chain, not just saying, I'm sustainable, and people having to trust you for your, for your word on that. So when it comes to blockchain, there is a lot of misconceptions, um, a lot of skepticism, but one thing that's really important to understand is there's different flavors of blockchain, right? There's, a, there's different characteristics that you can take into account, and what we have seen is that oftentimes there is a strong trade-off between using a public or a private blockchain. Private blockchains are basically saying, okay, I'm gonna run my own node of a blockchain, and I'm gonna select a few companies around me that can run that as well, meaning that the data is private, and access to that data and validation of that data is permission, so I control it. I can give you access, I can give you access, and I can make sure that you don't have access, which makes it easy because you can control privacy and confidentiality that way, and you can scale very fast because you're in control of the whole chain. It's not very great because I'm like a single point of failure, right? If I decide to like block you from the network, I can easily do that. So a better approach would be things like Bitcoin and Ethereum. There is no central party. There is nobody in the world that can say, hey, you're not allowed to use Ethereum. This is a piece of open source code. As long as you have internet, you can participate 
validate the data, but also be part of the network and use it. But the problem there is obviously privacy and confidentiality. Nobody's gonna put everything that they have on a public blockchain, potentially risking confidential data. Another problem with public blockchains, more of a misconception, is that they're using a lot of energy. Well, these are two things that we have solved with Circrise. Um, not, not, not exclusively, there's many other parties in the supply chain, but also in, in decentralized finance, et cetera, that we're working on these issues because once you solve that, we can truly have a public infrastructure for a circular economy. Anybody can enter data, there is no permission required, and you can be sure that that data is of high value using audited and trustworthy data points. So the way it works is that instead of adding, actually adding your own, the actual data in there, you can use something that's called a zero knowledge proof. It's a new field of cryptography. Um, maybe 10 years ago, people were calling this moon mat. This is not possible. But now we've actually proven at a production level that we can make sure that you can make statements without revealing sensitive data. So I can prove to you that my material contains X, Y, Z without showing my comp material composition ever. I don't even have to upload my material composition. I don't even encrypt it or put it somewhere else. Your material data, or any data for that matter, can remain wherever it already is. You don't have to share any of that. But you can mathematically prove characteristics about the data, making the case for using a public blockchain extremely, extremely well. Another problem with private systems, as opposed to public ones, is that in its supply chains, Material suppliers, they don't only supply to one single market, right? They don't only supply to automotive, they supply to appliances, electronics, textiles, construction, packaging, virtually anything, right? But on the other hand, if you're a brand owner or an OEM, you're not only buying plastics or metals or fabrics, we're actually buying many, many different materials in, in, in your full supply chain. So if you would have a private system, how do you scale beyond small pilots? How do you make sure that a, a company like Volkswagen has everything that they have on your system? Because again, you're gonna have to go through a, a lot of different supply chains and make sure that they all use that single, single product. So what we take inspiration from and that is really enabled by public blockchains is how email works. I can use Gmail, you can use Outlook, but we never question whether that's gonna work if I send sending an email even though they're competing solutions, we can still communicate with each other. And that's due to an open public infrastructure called IMTP and SMTP. These are public so, um, uh, infrastructures like uh, protocols, internet protocols, that anybody can use and implement. So this is how we see supply chain transparency being uh, operated on a global scale, where we can have different commercial solutions, such as the Gmail and Outlook, and we're one of them, so with Circrise. But there's an open infrastructure. We do not expect every single material in the world and every single market in the world to use the same solution. Right? So that's it in a nutshell. We're gonna do a panel with um, some other customers as well, like Questro, Domo, and, and, and colleagues from Porsche, uh, tomorrow at the end of the day at 5.30 p.m. And uh, yeah, would be great if you guys can join. And other than that, uh, that's my presentation. Is there any questions? stage. Garbage in, garbage out. That's often what we, what we say in, 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 a, in a blockchain space. If you put garbage in a blockchain, that's what you're going to get out of it. So the main reason why we work and collaborate with companies like UL is to make sure that data entry is not self-reporting a free form. You just put in and, and you make mistakes and there's fraudulent and bad actors. You really need to be sure that that data, whether that's recycled content certification or safety data, 
is actually audited and trustworthy at, at, at point of entry. But, and to add to that point, the great question is that because that is exactly the core of we, we play in, that a self-declaration is one thing. A third-party approved declaration is a totally different animal. And with that, you can uh, exactly get to the point you were asking for. Yes, just, just because it's on blockchain doesn't mean anything. Right. Yeah. right. Started five years ago, you could like count all the solutions on. Hello, you could count all the solutions on one hand. Nowadays, it's almost like one new solution every week popping up. There is a lot of activity in this space, um, and we see it growing exponentially. So we believe it's not decades, it's not it's not months either, but definitely not decades where we can have exponentially, you know, uh, putting. Transparency at, at, at scale in certain uh, applications. Others might be faster than others. Uh, like we have some industries that are much, much faster than others. Uh, so, yeah, but it's not going to be taking decades and decades anymore. There is a very strong exponential growth here. Because one thing to mention, the, the way these systems work is with a very strong network effect. The, the value of traceability and transparency is completely lost if you're just working with one single company. Are you going to be transparent to yourself, right? So traceability only makes sense in a network of companies. And the more people you add to it, the more valuable the network becomes for everybody. So it's the same with Facebook. If you're on your own on Facebook, there is no value. But the more friends, the more value it is. So it grows naturally at some point um, because it will bring more value to anybody entering the system uh, to anybody else as well. And to add up on that one, Governmental restrictions slash demands on uh, documentation are one demand driver, as well as OEMs and raw materials manufacturers in all supply chains searching for solutions on that. That is the driver behind these rapid growth. And we are of the opinion, now talking for OEUL, that solutions with your third party certified are needed and demanded on the market as of now. So we need to deliver it because otherwise if you go for self-declaration like ID, IBS uh, databases in automotive, they had their history, but the new uh, solution set up needs to come as we are talking. So it will be definitely not the case. And, and, and there's definitely laws and regulations playing a role as well with, with the German supply chain law uh, and, and, and many others as well that are uh, very, very recent and, and, and going to get kicking anytime soon. Uh, so that's going to be a, a very big enabler as well. Yeah, yeah, so basically a digital twin right now, as, as I presented it, represents a physical good. But that's only the definition that I just showed. A, a, a digital twin can represent anything. It could represent a kilowatt hour of energy. And in fact, there is startups doing that in the energy market where they tokenize every kilowatt of renewable energy and create marketplaces there. So like you can trace energy from, from its, from its uh, or origin, where it's being generated, all the way to its usage using similar technologies. But then one token on a blockchain doesn't equal a kilogram, it equals a kilowatt hour of energy. Some of our core tests rely on the energy dissipated when we burn it to identify what are the components of the material. Yeah, and, and it's a clear yes on the data, on the property of the, of the products as such, absolutely. 
in, in the reality is much more complex than, than, than the slides might, might look like. So in, in chemical uh, processes, you might have one kilogram of inputs and the output due to reactions and energy adding might be more than a kilogram, right? So mass balancing in those levels might mean that you want to add much more than just the, the physical inputs, but also the energy types of inputs as well. Um, so yeah, that, that, that's the balance that, that, that you definitely need to be able to cater to and have a, you know, at a high level, a, a system that can deal with all of these different types of input to be able to do chain of custody and mass balancing correctly over time uh, in complexities and supply chains.